As the effects of climate change intensify, Liz Truss becoming Prime Minister is looking to be pretty disastrous for the future of humanity. Truss backs drilling for more oil and gas and backs fracking. Meanwhile, she opposes onshore wind and has a bizarre hatred of wind farms. She is, in short, the last leader we need. And it only gets worse when we assess who's set to be in her top energy team. It's long been touted that current business and energy secretary Kwasi Kwarteng is set to be Truss's chancellor, giving him key strategic direction over the British economy. Kwarteng has so far been one of the biggest proponents of drilling for North Sea gas, even going so far as to reclassify the fossil fuel as a source of green energy. That was to encourage pension funds to stop divesting in the industry. And now, according to the Times, the person set to take up Kwarteng's current job is this man, Jacob Rees-Mogg. He is being lined up as the new Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And that's a concern because Mogg has long been a critic of climate action. Back in 2013, as a backbencher, he blamed high energy prices on what he called climate alarmism, arguing that people will die this winter because of the environmentalist obsession with the end of the world. In the piece, he wrote this. There are cheap sources of energy, either available or possible, but there is a reluctance to use them. Coal is plentiful and provides the least expensive electricity per megawatt, while fracking may provide a boon of shale gas. Unfortunately, coal-fired power stations are being shut down because of European Union regulations, and shale gas exploration is moving at a slow pace. So back in 2013, Rees Mogg was arguing for the expansion of coal, the absolute dirtiest of fossil fuels. And in that same article, he wrote this. It is widely accepted that carbon dioxide emissions have risen, but the effect on the climate remains much debated, while the computer modelling that has been done to date has not been proved especially accurate. Skeptics remember that computer modelling was behind the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the global financial crisis. Common sense dictates that if the meteorological office cannot forecast the next season's weather with any success, it is ambitious to predict what will happen decades ahead. Now, anyone who's followed the climate change debate over the past decades will recognize what Rees Mogg said there as a classic example of climate denial, trying to seed doubt where it shouldn't be. And now, if reports are true, this guy is set to be in charge of Britain's climate response. And it actually gets worse, I'm afraid to say. This is Rees Mogg in 2017. How important do you think a green environmental approach to politics is? Nowadays, depends what um, you're offering. Um, I would like my constituents to have cheap energy rather more than I would like them to have windmills. <laughs> so, you well, global warming, for example, is it, is is that for you a serious issue, man-made uh, uh, climate change, or perhaps you, you don't accept okay. that? If you read the IPCC report on this, it said that if we were to take action now to try and stop man-made global warming, it would have no effect for hundreds or possibly a thousand years. I'm all in favour of long-term policy making, but I think trying to forecast the climate for a thousand years and what little steps you make now, having an ability to change it, is unrealistic. And I think the cost of it is probably unaffordable. That was a complete lie. There has been no IPCC report which says that actions taken now will only have an effect in centuries' time. He is in fact twisting a very different claim that it could take centuries to reverse the climate change that has already happened. Of, of course, if we cut emissions now, that is going to have an effect before centuries time. It's going to have an effect to limit the catastrophe of climate change, even if it can't reverse the climate change we have experienced so far. Now, if you're wondering why Rees Mogg has this hostility to climate science and to renewable energy, this could provide a clue. It's a report from 2014 on Rees Mogg failing to declare interest when intervening in debates in the House of Commons. The interest in question? Investments in tobacco and energy firms. Finally, just in case you suspected that the extreme weather we've witnessed in the past couple of years might have changed Mogg's mind when it comes to climate action, here he is speaking to Nick Ferrari earlier this year. I think what we actually need is to make the economy more efficient. We need the supply side reforms that take obstacles out of 
this country. We need to be um, thinking about extracting every last cubic inch of gas from the North Sea because we want security of supply. But 2050 is a long time off. We're not trying to become net zero tomorrow and we are going to use, need fossil fuels in the interim and we should use ours that we have got available. And these are supply side reforms. These are regulatory reforms uh, that, that allow things to, to happen and to happen quickly. Yes, Jacob Rees-Mogg wants to cut regulation so that every last drop of gas can be extracted from the North Sea. This is despite the International Energy Agency stating in a recent landmark report, there is no need for investment in new fossil fuel supply in our net zero pathway. Beyond projects already committed as of 2021, there are no new oil and gas fields approved for development in our pathway and no new coal mines or mine extensions are required. Now, that was thought of as being particularly significant because that wasn't a climate change body. That was the International Energy Agency. They've often been um, a bit of an advocate for the development of fossil fuels. Their role um, when it comes to UN organizations is to say, how do we get enough energy into the world? Even they are saying, we do not need any new oil. We do not need any new gas fields. Now, Jacob Rees-Mogg, but it also applies to Liz Truss. It also applies to Kwasi Kwarteng. They are desperate to open as many new oil and gas fields as they can in the North Sea. Just when you think you've seen like the worst case scenario, I feel like British politics just like humbles you in the most brutal way. We have fewer than 10 years now to mitigate uh, against the most extreme and irreversible impacts of climate breakdown. And that involves decommissioning all fossil fuel projects and certainly not starting any new ones. Um, and instead, uh, Britain, which is a nation that arguably has the biggest historical responsibility for the climate crisis that we are in, has put in essentially a climate denier by another kind of um, appearance, throwing into dispute uh, the ability of climate scientists to accurately model or to seriously model or to basically model the seriousness of climate change um, is a form of climate denialism as far as I'm concerned. Um, that is catastrophic, uh, actually, that we have that we have decided to use these precious years um, and give them to someone like Jacob Brees Mogg. It's it's deeply unforgivable, especially given um, the historic role that Britain has played in bringing the world into this crisis to begin with. It's just such a wasted opportunity because for so many of the reasons that you've outlined, you know, um, it's the extreme weather that has been seen in Britain um, over the summer, that the cost of living crisis and the particular way this is playing out along the lines of energy. Um, you know, this, this could be a moment where we really reckon with the fact that our energy system has been broken for a really long time. Like energy, it's long been unaffordable for, for most of the global population. Um, the way that energy is extracted and distributed has had devastating consequences politically, ecologically, in all senses um, around the world. Um, it, it's, you know, our energy system has always actually been really bad uh, at doing what an energy system is supposed to do, which is to make sure that as many people around the world have enough energy to heat their home, cook their food, connect with their loved ones, connect with one another, et cetera. And even though technologically delivering that is fully within our capabilities, it's not being delivered because of the particular way that our energy system is designed and the energy source that we continually insist on using. And by we, I obviously don't mean everyday people. I mean, basically energy execs. And now the, the ineff ineffectiveness and the violence of that system um, is starting to really hit the global north. This should be a time where globally we can really form bonds of solidarity and talk about and, and figure out how we are going to make real, the dramatic changes that we need to make of our energy system, of decommodifying and, and decarbonizing um, our energy system. You know, doing that in the time frame that we have is not an easy feat. Even if we threw everything that we have at it, we might not manage it. Um, it requires like all hands on deck. It requires a collaborative, global, committed effort. And yet, instead of doing that, we are wasting 
precious time having arguments and discussions with people like Jacob Rees-Mogg that range from like the completely facile, like debating how attractive solar panels and wind farms are to like the downright murderous, which is, you know, commissioning new fossil fuel projects, given the science that we know. Um, you know, future generations, if, if they ever exist, will look back in absolute horror um, at what people like Rees-Mogg and Truss were allowed to do um, with these precious years that we cannot get back. I often thought sort of the comparisons of, of Boris Johnson to Donald Trump were often a bit overblown. Um, but this, this does seem a bit like a Donald Trump appointment. Obviously, this would be Liz Truss making, making this appointment, not Boris Johnson. Putting someone who has a history of not really believing in climate change in the, the department that is responsible for climate change, and then also having this sort of just bizarre politics of, of saying, onshore wind, we p- couldn't possibly do that. Solar farms, we couldn't possibly do that. And saying it to their base in, in the Tory party. Like it, it reminds me of those Donald Trump speeches where he's talking to his really right-wing Republican base, sort of complaining about how wind farms kill birds. Now, when we watched those clips in the UK... Everyone was like, God, what an insane guy. Thank God, you know, our politicians might be bad, but at least they're not Donald Trump. Now we have the next government looks set to, and actually this has been a case for for a long time, it's it's essentially impossible to build new onshore wind because it's so easy to object to it. Local communities don't get to have a vote and make a majority decision on whether you build um, wind farms onshore. If you have a few people who are against it, it doesn't happen. Now, that's, that, that's not the case of all developments, but the Tories have made that the case with onshore wind because they have some ideological, dogmatic opposition to it. Now we're seeing exactly the same thing with solar farms. And I do just feel like if, if it was Donald Trump saying what Jacob Rees-Mogg and Liz Truss are saying, people in this country would be, oh, God, what are they doing over there? How have they let this person get into power? Isn't this terrible? We're, we're all completely alive to the risks of climate change because we're sensible, educated people. What's wrong with them over there? We've now got these people who are about to enter office here, right? Boris Johnson was silly. Boris Johnson was stupid. These people are actually more ideologically committed to the end of the world than Boris Johnson was. Apparently, it was often reported that he was sort of pushing back against this idea that we should unban fracking or that we should go hell for leather in terms of, of digging in the North Sea. Potentially, um, his, his girlfriend, now wife, was you know, somewhat concerned about climate change and, and green issues. These people are more extreme than Boris Johnson, and they're getting closer and closer to the Donald Trump wing of politics when it comes to climate change. That's very, very scary. Very, very scary, especially when you're looking at the kind of scenes we're seeing in Pakistan right now, the kind of scenes we're seeing in the Horn of Africa. Climate change is killing a lot of people right now. And we are putting these amateur jokers in power who get their climate science from like the back pages of The Spectator and then weird blogs by James Dellingpole. Like it's, it's terrifying and it's, you know, the consequences are going to be really disastrous. And I don't think people in this country have woken up to quite how extreme our next government is going to be.